Following the death of the seven-year-old Leo II, his father, Zeno the Asarian, assumed sole control of the Roman Empire in the East. However, I'm not going to talk about Zeno yet. I'm instead going to talk about Basiliscus, who revolted against Zeno and held Constantinople for about 20 months while Zeno was effectively in exile. Why am I doing that, you might ask? Well, Basiliscus's coup was such a dominant event that I feel that we can really only understand Zeno's early reign by looking at it in great detail, and it really will give us a lot of background into why Zeno had so many troubles holding on to the throne and really prospering as emperor. So one of the themes that I really want to look at is how mediocrity can really prosper in a time of discontent. Zeno was not popular early on simply because of his Asarian heritage. So some people wanted someone who was more just plain Roman. And Basiliscus offered them that, even if he offered them literally nothing else. And this is the story of the people of Rome and some of the elites turning to Basiliscus and then living to regret that decision and having to confess that they were in fact wrong. Who was Basiliscus and where did he come from? Well, he grew up with his sister in the Balkans. We don't know exactly where, but we think it may have been in either Thrace or Illyricum since these areas tended to produce a lot of soldiers and we know that um, Basiliscus went into the army while his sister ended up marrying a soldier named Leo, a guy who went on to become a high-ranking officer and then the emperor. Now, Basiliscus himself was married to a woman named Zenonis, and he also had a son named Marcus. If you're an ambitious career soldier, then having your brother-in-law become the emperor of the Roman world is probably one of the best things that can happen to you, short of becoming the emperor yourself. So, after Leo took the throne, Basiliscus's cause was championed by his sister Verena, and then he was immediately thrust into high command since he was someone who the imperial couple could trust. He was appointed to be the Ducks of Thrace, and he led a successful campaign in that region in 463. Um, he was promoted to Master of Soldiers in Thrace in 464, and he was able to win several key victories against the Goths and the Huns in 466 to 467. These would be the Ostrogoths and the remnants of the Huns, who were never quite the same after Attila's death. Now, because of all of these victories and because of his marital relation to Leo, he had won Leo's trust by 468, and Leo saw him as a dependable option when it came time to mount a major expedition and put a single general at the head of this massive military undertaking. The sack of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths was probably the most shocking thing that happened in the 5th century, but when it happened again in 455 at the hands of the Vandals who descended on Rome from the sea, this was actually a much more devastating sack of the city. It lasted for a couple weeks and the Vandals carried off all kinds of antiquities and treasures completely unopposed. Actually, there was a negotiated surrender of the city. Um, so, the Emperor Marcion was in power in 455. He didn't do anything, which has caused a lot of debate among scholars, and a lot of sources tried to explain it themselves. There's the famous story that Marcion had sworn to never take up arms against the Vandals. At any rate, um, when we get to the reign of Leo, it's the year 468, and Leo wants to make good the sack of Rome. And there's another pretext that is also convenient, and that is that there are Aryan Christians who are persecuting Orthodox Christians in North Africa because the new Vandal king who succeeded Geiseric was a much more staunch uh, Christian who wanted to enforce his faith um, and not do it by choice. Um, another motive anytime anybody is going from North Africa is that what we now call Tunisia was and still is a breadbasket in the Mediterranean world, so acquiring that territory would be a major boon for the Eastern Empire. That's one of the reasons why it ended up being one of the major uh, first targets for Justinian's Wars of Reconquest. At any rate, um, Basiliscus, who was seen as a reliable and competent commander, 
was chosen to be the supreme commander of this expedition, which involved a large army, which would be ferried by a large navy, and it would require a lot of complex coordination because this force was too big to move as a single unit, so it would require a lot of communication, and that they would have to travel separately in order to um, stay supplied. So this ended up being a three-pronged attack. Two prongs were under more minor generals, and those two prongs, which were effectively set up to be the versions, were successful. So successful that when Basiliscus landed with the main force relatively near Carthage, the Vandals said that they were ready to surrender. So they offered to surrender, and then Basiliscus just sat in port and uh, was hanging out. He thought that the expedition was over. Well, while he was drinking and being merry on a ship, the Vandals put together some fire ships and sent them into his packed ships by the shore. His fleet was destroyed, and he was captured along with many of his men. This is one of the most humiliating, probably not the most devastating, but definitely the most humiliating episodes in Roman military history. The expedition of 468 was Leo's greatest undertaking, and its failure was something that really rankled Leo. Leo was absolutely furious with Basiliscus for letting this disaster occur, and he had every intention of executing him, but Basiliscus took refuge in a church sanctuary, and then Verena was eventually able to intercede on her brother's behalf, and Leo eventually relented and allowed um, Basiliscus to go into exile. So for two or three years, Basiliscus was in the political wilderness. By 471, uh, Leo and his son-in-law Zeno were engaged in a struggle for supremacy with Aspar and his sons, and Leo needed all hands on deck, so Basiliscus was recalled, and he was used as an ally and functionary in that struggle. It is recorded that he actually helped in the murder of Aspar, so he was one of the guys who um, helped to arrange that assassination. At the same time, uh, Basiliscus was then given a new command, along with his nephew Armatus, who we'll talk more about, and they put down a revolt by Theodoric Strabo, who was the leader of the Ostrogoths in the Eastern Balkans. But by 474, when uh, Leo I died and then the throne passed to Leo II and Zeno, Basiliscus had decided to retire and he was living at Heraclea. The fact that Basiliscus was living in exile at Heraclea implies either that Zeno did not want him on the political scene anymore and had ordered him to call it quits, or that Basiliscus simply looked around and saw that there were no more opportunities for him and that his time had passed. At any rate, um, Basiliscus's time was going to come once again, because in 474, the same year he retired, Leo I, his brother-in-law, died, and then Leo I's grandson, Leo II, died at the age of seven, which left Zeno the Asaurian on the throne. Now, Zeno was unpopular due to his Asaurian heritage, and he was distrusted by many people in the capital, both elite and common. He also inherited four different small wars against the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Huns, and the Arabs. So, between the foreign crises that Zeno was having to manage and his Asaurian heritage, he was deeply disliked. Why were the Asaurians disliked? Well, we'll recall back to the video on Leo, Leo had allowed many Asaurians to come to the capital, and they had mostly hired themselves out as bodyguards for the wealthy, in which capacity they were used mostly as thugs. So, um, this means that there's now a sort of vacuum for any kind of anti-Asaurian leader, and there's a sort of yearning for a native emperor. Um, so... Basiliscus will ultimately be able to play into this, but he's not the first person to get the idea. The first person is actually his sister Verena, and she has a very different candidate in mind to take advantage of this yearning. So Verena seems to have mostly tolerated Zeno while her grandson Leo II was alive and in power, but once Leo II was dead, Verena decided to pursue her own ambition and work against her son-in-law.
So, as soon as her grandson was in the ground, she started plotting. And her plan was to replace Zeno with her lover Patricius, who was a former master of offices, the head of the bureaucracy. So he would have been an Anastasius come early, more or less. Uh, I'm assuming that he had the administrative skills of Anastasius based on his former job. Now, um, Verena, as usual, turned to her brother Basiliscus for help. He was an experienced person with a big name, and she wanted him to help her out by winning over Kiasarian officials Illus and Trocundes, and she wanted those two Asarian brothers to break away from Zeno and throw their lot behind Patricius, and Basiliscus would be her messenger to them. Um, at the same time, Verena's role in this plot was to convince Zeno that he was in danger, and he believed her. At this point, he had no reason to distrust her, and he fled to Asaria, which enabled the coup to get underway. Once the Asarian emperor was off the scene and it became public knowledge that he had fled the capital, the populace sort of rose up and began a spontaneous massacre of the remaining Asarians in the city. And they probably numbered at least in the thousands and probably somewhere over 10,000. So this was not a small massacre. There would have been literal blood in the streets. At the same time, though, Patricius was not going to take the throne. Because when Basiliscus had won over the support of Illus and Trocundes, he had also won over some other chief ministers and some senators. And when he realized that he had the support, maybe uh, they either didn't like Patricius or he just simply went to them and used his own name and, you know, betrayed his scissor from the outset. I don't know exactly how he did it. But at any rate, he won key supporters and then he sort of took the... Um, leadership of this anti-Asarian movement and had himself crowned emperor and he quickly followed up by having his wife Zenonis crowned as empress and then had his son crowned as Caesar and then later Augustus. As is generally the case with any usurper, Basiliscus decided to eliminate the two people who posed the biggest threat to him in his mind. The first was Zeno, so he sent an army under Illus and Trocundus to take care of him. We'll talk about that war later on. And he also immediately ordered Patricius to be executed. Now, he saw Patricius as a threat because Patricius, of course, was the person his sister Verena wanted to elevate to the throne originally. However, the fact that Basiliscus was able to co-opt the coup so easily implies that no one really wanted Patricius as emperor and that he was no real threat. So... By executing Patricius, all Basiliscus did was alienate his sister Verena. Now, you could possibly make the argument that um, she would already be pissed because of the betrayal, but it's also possible that she would have come around because she would have been the sister of the new emperor and would have had quite a bit of influence. But as it is, these two are going to be completely at odds for the rest of their lives, so far as I'm aware. When he came to power... He found the treasury was empty. Zeno had taken most of the money with him when he had fled. He had not fled in panic. So Basiliscus needed money to pay off his soldiers and make sure that people would be loyal to him. So he was forced to raise heavy taxes, and that's never popular. Um, one thing that he restored is an unpopular practice where you sell offices to the highest bidder. For obvious reasons, this is considered corrupt by almost everyone. And the thing that he did, which really alienated a lot of people in the city and a lot of the important church figures who were the best rabble-rousers around, was that he extorted money from the church itself. Now, where he really screws up is that unlike his predecessors, like Leo, he decides that he is not an Orthodox Christian and that not only will he just go his own way privately, but he's actually going to try to enforce his will on everyone else. He's a convinced monophysite, a monophysite being someone who believes that Christ only has one nature divine. And so he issues a decree which declares the Council of Chalcedon forfeit, and this alienates the patriarch, um, as well as the public, which tended to support the patriarch, and the public was mostly Orthodox Christian, if our sources are to be believed. Um, at the same time, he also appoints his nephew Armatus as master of soldiers. Now, people often appoint their sons and nephews and cousins to high uh, 
office because they can rely on them. However, you have to be careful about which relatives you put in power. Um, Armatus was not exactly the most stable guy. Let's talk about Armatus because he's actually the most interesting part of the entire Basiliscus saga. To say that Armatus was unsuited for high command and responsibility is an understatement. He was young, vain, and cruel. He quickly alienated a lot of the people around him, and his actions helped to make Basiliscus seem a lot worse than he really was. Because when you have officials going around committing acts of cruelty, this reflects very poorly on the emperors who promote these people. This is one of the things which really undermined the popularity of the Emperor Balans back in the 4th century. So, under Leo I, Armatus had gotten a start, and he had actually gotten things off on the right foot by cutting off all the hands of a bunch of Thracian rebels that he had caught. This was considered cruel and unusual punishment in the eyes of most Byzantines. It was considered to be a bit unnecessary. So, Armatus already had a reputation, and he did not really mature or change. And I would say that he comes off as a lot like the Achilles that we see Brad Pitt portray in the movie Troy. He was someone who was a total douchebag. Um, one of uh, Armatus's most interesting habits is that he liked to actually dress as Achilles. And then he would parade through the streets in the Hippodrome, and he would really get delighted when someone would observe that he's dressed like Achilles, and if they would comment on his looks in a favorable way, he would really just preen and be proud. Um, someone told him that his rosy cheeks reminded them of Pyrrhus, and that also went through his head, and he thought about trying to call himself Pyrrhus rather than Achilles for a while. So this is someone who is deeply unstable and should not have been entrusted with much responsibility. Yet, he is effectively Basiliscus's chief general due to his office of Master of Soldiers. Although Basiliscus was a deeply incompetent ruler, he does seem to have had a certain degree of charisma. Remember, when he was sent to win over Illus and Trocundus for the uh, cause of Patricius, he managed to win them over to his own cause. And then he got them to fight a war against their fellow Asarian Zeno on his behalf, while the population of Constantinople, with his approval and his tacit support, was massacring other Asarians. However, you can imagine if you're Illus and Trocundus as this war against Zeno drags on, and Zeno is able to sustain himself with all the gold that he took, you know, you start to get weary of the war, and you also start to really doubt Basiliscus and his regime because of all the things that are going on against your people back in the capital. And as time passes, Basiliscus really starts to alienate people in the capital. Over his 20-month reign, people really start to get tired of him. And officials at court start to contact the various generals like Illus and Trocundes and ask for them to shift their support back to Zeno because they just think that this level of corruption and this attempt to force the empire to become monophysite is simply beyond the pale and unacceptable. Basiliscus was ultimately undone by two things. One, the fact that he did not deliver a quick knockout blow to Zeno, who had no intention of relinquishing the throne, and two, his own corruption and incompetence, which alienated all of the key people around him and made them pine for the good old days of Zeno the Asarian, which they hadn't really experienced more than a couple months of at any rate. Um, so basically what happens is that as Illus and Trocundes are fighting this long war against Zeno, they have won some battles, but they haven't managed to win anything decisive. Illus, who is the senior of the two brothers, does manage to capture Zeno's brother Longinus, and that gives him leverage against Zeno, so he feels like he will be able to switch his allegiance back to Zeno and protect himself against any backlash. So, Illus and Trocundes are able to reconcile with Zeno, and for Zeno's part, he wants to get back in the power. That's his number one objective, so he's willing to accept the insincere apology of Illus, who, by the way, continued to keep his brother in captivity. Another key supporter of Basiliscus in the Balkans, actually, was Theodoric Strabo, the leader of some one group of the Ostrogoths, and Basiliscus hadn't done enough to appease him because Theodoric Strabo was supposed to get one of the Master of Soldiers jobs that ended up going to Armatus. 
So Theodoric is also not willing to come to the aid of uh, Basiliscus should something go wrong, and he's kind of on the fence now about who to support. So um, what happens is Zeno and Illus will join forces, and they have a large Asarian army, and now they're marching back to Constantinople. So in order to try to shore up the home front, Basiliscus quickly backtracks on all of his unpopular ecclesiastical policy. He reinstates the Council of Chalcedon. However, the people aren't buying it. They know at this point that he's a monophysite. He's revealed his hand, and they are ready to be done with him. So no one is rallied back to his cause by his sudden and obviously opportunistic change of heart. Now that Zeno and Illus are marching on Constantinople, it might look like a 50-50 proposition from a military perspective. After all, Basiliscus controls the army of the Balkans, and Zeno now controls the army of the East. And these two forces are about equal in size and strength, so far as I'm aware. But, Basiliscus has a sort of anti-ace up his sleeve. He has his nephew Armatus as his chief military um, commander. So he entrusts Armatus with the coming confrontation which will occur outside of Constantinople. So when the two armies are supposed to meet, Zeno is able to win over Armatus to his cause. He promises to make Armatus master of soldiers for life, which means that Armatus will now get to parade around as Achilles until death does him part, and his son will be named as Caesar and Zeno's successor. So Armatus will not only get to be a great warrior on behalf of Byzantium, but his son will go on to become emperor. Um, so Armatus, rather than fighting Zeno or joining him directly against his uncle, just stands aside. So he moves his army out of the way, and then Zeno is able to simply enter Constantinople. And here I have a picture of Starscream. Um, if you've ever watched the Heavy Metal Wars Transformer movie from the late 80s, you know that as soon as Megatron ran into difficulty, that Starscream started kicking him while he was down and took command and, you know, betrayed him in a pretty brazen manner. I think that that's fitting. This is essentially what Armatus did to his uncle Basiliscus. The defection of Armatus and his army meant that Zeno was able to take Constantinople without any real opposition, and he was able to capture the would-be imperial family. So Basiliscus, Zenania, and Marcus were all captured, and then they were sent to a fortress in Cappadocia, where they were walled off in a dry cistern and left to die in August when it was really hot. Um, later, um, after biding his time and initially fulfilling the terms of the agreement with Armatus, Zeno took measures and had him executed as well. You can't trust a traitor. Anyway... Um, sort of the legacy of Basiliscus is that members of his family would continue to play a prominent role in Byzantine affairs. His estranged sister Verena would continue to intrigue against her son-in-law Zeno until she eventually met her death in 484. Um, surprisingly, not at the hands of Zeno, who probably should have had her executed based on how many times she tried to plot against him. And Basiliscus' niece was Zeno's wife, Ariadna, and she would continue to be a major force in Byzantine politics for years, including selecting Zeno's successor, Anastasius, by selecting him as her new husband upon her old husband, Zeno's death. So that's the closest thing that Basiliscus has to a legacy. Um, I would say that his main claim to fame, the main thing that I think of when I think of him is I think of Armatus strutting around like Achilles and being a complete and total tool. So anyway, um, now we can talk about the reign of Zeno and we needn't go into a lot of detail when we talk about Basiliscus' usurpation since all of that information is right here. <laughs> 